Well, hello and welcome to North Point Church. My name is Pastor Rob Wilson. Welcome to our worship this morning. This is the beautiful Easter season on the church calendar where we don't just celebrate the resurrection one Sunday, we get to celebrate for a whole season until we welcome the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the church. So let me welcome our visitors today. Thank you for joining North Point. We are located here in Paulsville, Washington. Glad that you have joined us for worship and always feel free to drop me a line at rob at np-church.org to just say hello. We'd love to know who's worshiping with us online. And let me introduce our message for today. We're going to be through this Easter season in the letter of 1 John. And 1 John is one of these wonderful letters. I think it's less a letter than it is, as you're going to hear in the message, a lecture, a sermon that tells us what it means to follow Jesus, what it meant for John, and what it can mean for us. So I'm excited to share with you the first message in this new series, Following Jesus 101. Welcome to the classroom. Welcome to worship at North Point Church. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Let's gather together in silence this morning around God's Word. Prepare your hearts to worship on this Sunday after the resurrection. Our words that will call us to worship, and I'll ask you to ponder in deep silence, come from Psalm 62. Let's hear them. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From God comes my salvation. He alone is my rock. He alone is my salvation. My fortress. And I shall never be shaken. For God alone my soul waits in silence. It's who you are. 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 It's who you
these words come from 1 John. He says, if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we take this opportunity each and every week to remind ourselves that each and every one of us falls short, and we need to be made whole, and we seek healing and restoration. So in the silence of this sanctuary, would you please be in prayer Lord, we thank you for the gift of being able to be transparent with you. We thank you that you love us, that we can take our masks off with you, that we can come and confess things that are heavy upon our hearts. And so in the silence of this sanctuary, Lord, take the heavy things, the heavy things that have grown us so weary of caring, and hear them. And all God's people together said, Amen. As I think I've told you once before, one of my children, after hearing the prayer of confession week in and week out, came home and said, Dad, you never allow enough time for the prayer of confession. (laughs) And I said, Son, what have you been doing? (laughs) Friends, let me proclaim to you what I proclaim to him. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made whole. And all God's people say, Amen. Nothing can separate, even if I ran away, your love. Work 
together for my good. I welcome you to the table of our Lord to celebrate the sacrament of communion this morning. And as we begin, let's open with um, just a brief prayer that um, invites us into a time of reflection on this meal, but also a time of reflection with brothers and sisters all over the globe. As you can see from our clocks on the wall, um, we are in ministry partnership with brothers and sisters from India and from South Africa. And our pastoral or communion prayer this morning comes from Alan Patton, who wrote the famous novel, Cry of the Beloved, one of the best known statements of what it meant to live in South Africa under apartheid. And so with Alan's heart and soul, um, we'll start this communion time and remembering brothers and sisters all around the globe who have communion on this post-Easter Sunday. Would you pray with me? Um, give us courage, O oh Lord. Courage to stand up and be counted. To stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. To stand up for ourselves when it is needful for us to do so. Let us fear nothing more than we fear you. Let us have nothing more than we love you, for thus shall we shall fear nothing also. Let us have no other God before you, whether nation or party or state or church. Let us seek no other peace but the peace which is yours and makes us your instruments. Opening our eyes, opening our ears, opening our hearts so that we should know and always know the work of peace that we may do for you. And Lord, that prayer brings us to the table for the prayer for the work that you did at the table. And so as we gather on this Sunday in this part of the world, remembering brothers and sisters who eat this meal in different places, different contexts, we thank you for the honor of coming. We ask it in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior and all God's people said, amen. So friends, this is the table of our Lord and I get to say and proclaim to you that in our tradition we have what's called an open table. What that means is there is no barrier here. You are welcome to come and receive if you feel the call of God to be nourished today. And in our tradition, we have children who, and youth who can come and be nourished at the table as well. And so kids, we are so glad that you are here and want you to know as you come forward, God loves you deeply. So we remember, don't we? As we did just a week plus ago that our Lord gathered with his disciples in the upper room. And after having given thanks, to God in heaven, he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this, he said, every time in remembrance of me. In the same way, the scripture tells us Jesus took the cup, saying this cup is the cup of a new covenant, sealed in my blood, bloodshed to forgive people of their sins. Every time you do this, he said, do this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul will go on to proclaim as often as we do this, eat this bread, drink this cup, even this morning, we proclaim that Christ died, Christ rose, Christ 
will come again. So this morning, our deacons may come forward and will be helping uh, me serve communion to you today. And I'd remind you as they come and make their way to their stations that um, the way we take uh, the Last Supper is to have you come, leave your, your row by the, the left-hand side, come forward, take the, take the bread, and, and partake of that right away if you'd like. That reminds us that we choose to follow God out of our own free will and volition. And then if you could, take the cup back to your seat with you. If you forget, that's okay, but take it back to your seat with you, and we will drink together as community. This reminds us that at the table and in our Lord, we are called to be a family of faith, and we celebrate this meal together. So, friends, oh, and one other reminder, if you cannot make your way forward, would you just please let the person next to you know to let your servers know that, and we'll make our way out to you, or just raise your hand, and someone will find their way to you. So, friends, these are God's gifts for you, the people of God, the children of God. Come and receive.
Friends, as God's family this morning, gathered in this place in this time, take drink at this time. And then let us pray together. Good and gracious God, feed us. Give us drink, living water. Give meaning, purpose. Give us grace and love for the living of these days. We pray that we may be empowered. Thus, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's children said together the prayer he taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. One thing we do talk about at session, though, is the gratitude that we have for um, those who um, make our ministry possible. And we are so um, awed by the generosity of North Point Church. And so at this time... I'd love for our um, offering folks to come forward with the plates this time. The plates are up here. <laughs> On Easter Sunday, we forgot to put the plates out. But hey, that's all right. Something, something fun is always going to happen. And let's pray together um, as we get ready to give this morning of a generous heart. Would you pray with me? God, you are generous in your love, in your patience, in your loving kindness thank you. And as we have been blessed, you do so that we may bless others. So take everything, Lord, that is given in these plates and use it to bless this community, to extend around the world even. We ask this in the name of our good God, our generous God. Amen. O Christ, we come with empty hands our broken pieces bring we offer you our weary wandering heart please take each piece forgive our sin and make us whole again refine us by your spirit Holy God, you are the author of amazing grace. You are the founder of our faith. Welcome to our post-Easter sermon series, and, and whether you knew it or not, you know, this season between Easter Sunday and Pentecost Sunday, we call on the church calendar the Easter season. 
So we don't just get to celebrate the resurrection one Sunday. We get to celebrate it for a period of, of, of weeks here leading up to when we will learn about the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the church. So as I was reflecting on this Easter season, a spiritual mentor of mine suggested 1 John might be a good um, topic for us to study. And that's because 1 John is a real basic primer on what it means to follow Jesus in the world. And we're going to look at why 1 John was written today. We'll do a little summary of it. But um, I believe that the early church had one voice that the Apostle John um, wrote several, he actually was a very prolific writer of the New Testament. Um, if the early church is to, be, is to be believed, and I mean the first couple centuries, um, they attested that the gospel according to John, three letters, or we call them epistles, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, plus the book of Revelation, um, were written by the Apostle John. And 1 John contains five short chapters. They're very brief, but very pithy, and they will take us through the Easter season. So, go ahead and find, if you brought your Bible with you this morning, find your way to 1 John, and I'll give you a minute to do that. Are you still, are you still looking? Those of you? Because my point is it's kind of hard to find. So, who turned right to it? Right after Peter. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. So first, it's funny, isn't it? We, we can all find the gospel according to John, but first, second, and third John are these small little books, and they're kind of hard to find in the New Testament witness, right? So let me give you a, a little hint here. The way to find your way to first John is go to the very back. Go to the book of Revelation and just start turning backwards. And you turn backwards, you'll find a little book called Jude, and then all of a sudden you're in third John, and finding your way to first John is really easy from there. But isn't it interesting that... Um, we, we don't often give these later epistles or letters their credence just because they come so late in, in the canon, right? So this is kind of, maybe you've never read First John before, and I, I hope that entering into this series, you will discover something about following Jesus 101. And I use that title because we call this an epistle, um, or a letter, okay? That's what the word epistle means. And John, though, preaches it a little more to me, or he writes it more like a sermon or even a lecture, like you're walking into a lecture hall and you're about to learn something. There's more, it's less a letter, and we're going to see that today because we're going to start at chapter 1, verse 1. Now, the reason I say that it's a, written like a Jewish professor walking into the lecture hall is because it is written in a very um, Hebraic style. And let me tell you what, what I mean by that. Let me give you an analogy, actually, for this. Um, there are two ways to tour a museum. Um, the first is to tour it very systematic. And some of you are just, that you are hardwired um, to, to tour a museum like this. You like going in the order that the curator of the museum has laid out, right? You get your ticket, you go to point A, B, C, D. Um, has anyone ever been to the Vatican museums? Anyone ever been there? Okay, so quite a few of you. So you, you know what I'm about. When I, I've been there twice and to the Vatican museums, and if you get a, a ticket for a tour on a busy day, and a lot of them are busy days, um, even if you have a tour guide, that this is how the Vatican museums are laid out, right? You go from one room to another, and you weave back and forth. You go through these great, beautiful halls, and you kind of move like a big herd. Um, and if there's a lot of people, um, as a matter of fact, one time Barbara and I were leading a group of kids on a tour through the Vatican Museum, and um, it was so busy and full that one of the young women in our group literally got an anxiety attack. It was frightening in the middle and just trying to figure out how to get her out because we were all going from A to B to C to D, right? Um, that is how, um, I don't know if you know this, but, but that's how a lot of people um, learn, right, in a lecture, it's a very Western or Greek way of learning. Very systematic, isn't it? Very orderly. You learn this, this, and this. Think about how we teach kids to write essays. You start with an introduction, 
right? And then you have three points, and then you have a conclusion very well laid out. That's one way to teach, and it's one way to learn. It's one way to tour a museum. But there's another way. I don't know if you know this, but there's another way to tour a museum. And it's when there's a guide, you go in, and if your guide has room to move about, which you don't always have in the Vatican museums, they don't have to go in a systematic order. As a matter of fact, they, they can make their way from A to M because they say, oh, this relates to M over here. I want to take you over here. And you go and you look at this exhibit. And then you, you go, oh, I want to take you over to S over here because that has something to say. And you, you kind of move your way around. Now, there's at the Vatican, actually, if you go to the Vatican museums, the, you, I don't know if they still offer this, but one time when I was there, they offered a ticket called A Night at the Museum where you could go on the, in the very same museums except the Sistine Chapel. Do you know that every tour of the Vatican ends in the Sistine Chapel, where you get to look up at Michelangelo's great, great piece of art painted between 1508 and 1512. Um, but a night at the museum, you get to do everything except the Sistine Chapel, but the advantage of it is there's not a lot of people there. And you can go from A to S. And you get a guide, and, and they take you around, but they take you in a totally different order. And it may seem random a little bit. That, my friends, is not only the second way to tour a museum, it's, it's more of the Jewish way of teaching, a rabbinic way of teaching and learning. Very, maybe non-systematic, but it, it's almost topical. That is how 1 John is written. That's what I want you to know. As we step into 1 John and start reading, you need to know that our guide is going to be John. And John is going to take you not in systematic order. So it's not a letter or a book laid out in that way. But he, he kind of goes like a night at the museum. He's going to take us over here and then here and then back sometimes. And he's going to jump around and we need to get used to that. By the way, we're not, we are used to it, aren't we? If you've read um, much of the Hebrew scriptures, like the book of Proverbs, written very much the same way. Um, other books, the book of James in the New Testament, and obviously um, we have John, 1 John is written this way. So, with all of that being said, why don't we turn and see where John begins his tour for us about following Jesus 101, what you need to know. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Friends, this is God's word given to us today. And together we say, Thanks be to God. And let's say a quick prayer of inspiration. Lord, do inspire now our hearts and our minds to hear a word that you would have spoken to us deep in our souls. Maybe just plant a seed, but our ears are open to hear you. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, our redeemer. All right, well, before I unpack, uh, we unpack these verses, um, four verses that start off, did you notice they're not like a letter? They, it doesn't read like a letter. It's not like, I, Paul, write to you the Colossians, right, in grace and peace. N none of that, none of that. He just jumps right in, doesn't he? And he starts teaching his curriculum. He wants you to know some things right away. And what is this curriculum? Well, John, we need to understand one thing before we keep going here, and, th and that is this, that um, <laughs> John is writing with a very specific purpose, which he will reveal to us a little later on. 
But we have to know that, a little bit about that. A lot of times we Protestants in our tradition, we have this notion that Christian faith and doctrine went, a, went along cohesively, right, and gradually until the church then fell into air, and that it took a long time to do that. Do you know the first split of the church happened in 1054? We call it the Great Schism. And in the Great Schism, you had the, the Orthodox side of the church. So think of the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, that family of faith. They broke with the um, Western church. The Orthodox was the Eastern, right? And then we had the Western church, which became then the Roman Catholic church. And that was the first split. And then we have this notion in the Protestant tradition, don't we, that things went along for 500 years and those Catholics really messed things up. That's how we kind of teach it in our minds. And that then Martin Luther, John Calvin, um, other Protestant reformers come along and they set things straight again. And we've been great ever since, right? That's our, that's our Protestant notion of it. Now, um, now, there were some things, right, right in the Reformation that were definitely wrong. And, and we can name those and talk about them. But do you know, um, the real truth is it didn't take long for the Christian church to fall into air. It did not take 1,500 years. It didn't take till 1054. It took just a matter of years, probably months, and things were going astray, and that's what John notices. The Apostle John notices a group of Christians and a movement in the church that has veered off a path of proclaiming who Jesus was and the nature of Jesus. And so we need to know one thing before we kind of interpret this, these verses for us today, and that is about a, the group that kind of wandered off that he's addressing here. And they had their name in a, in a word called docetus, D-O-C-E, dosa, T-I-S-T-S, docetus, okay? And docetism is founded in this great word in the Greek language, dokesis, and it means an appearance or an illusion, so how did they get their name? Docetists believe many things, and they would later turn into a group called the Gnostics, or a form of them would turn into Gnostics. But what the Docetists believed, Docetus, was that um, the mind and the spirit were good, but the flesh, the body, was bad. It's evil. Their belief was really that matter, all matter, was inherently evil and the spiritual was good. So, so how did they think then about Jesus? Well, they, they came, when it came to the nature of Jesus, Docetus found this really troubling that Jesus was incarnate, that he became part of a body. That was almost repulsive to them. And so in their minds, they created this dualism that, that um, created this sense that Jesus was a, somewhat of a phantom, that he was a spirit and he just appeared to have a body because they could not bear the thought, right, that he would actually have a human body. And this was being taught. And can you imagine how John responded? Friends, this is John. This is John who saw the full humanity of Jesus, right? John saw him get tired and sit down by a well in John chapter 4. He says he was tired and hungry. This is John who probably saw Jesus when he was weary and sleeping and taking a nap. <laughs> Jesus maybe snored, and John had heard it, and he's saying, no, he was a body. John saw Jesus die, brutally in fact, on a cross. He saw him bleed, not phantom blood, real blood. And friends, this is John who then saw the resurrected Jesus, not as a resurrected as a spirit, but a bodily resurrection. And so the docetists don't like this. The Gnostics would grow not to like this. They didn't like this sense that Jesus had a resurrected body. Yuck. Why have a resurrected body? That body, that matter stuff is bad. So this is what John saw. This is the danger that he saw. Now, here's the other thing. These groups that were breaking off, they were gaining popularity, weren't they? And influence. 
And John feels the need to write. So what does he do? Look at what he did. Look at those verses again. John walks right into the lecture hall, right into the classroom. He doesn't even say hello. (laughs) He walks right into the museum, and he starts taking you on a tour. He doesn't even say, hello, I'm Professor John. He doesn't, say, he doesn't introduce himself. He doesn't say, welcome to my class. No. He walks straight in and without wasting any time. He doesn't even wait in the line. He walks up to the equivalent of the Mona Lisa. <laughs> and he says, this is the masterpiece. This is it. He takes us right to the master himself, doesn't he? And that's where he begins. That's how he starts. Look at those words with me again. Let me, let me read them to you. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. Think about that for a minute. Look at all the senses he talks about. Did you notice that? He is insistent that I heard his voice and it wasn't a phantom. Insistent that I have seen this Jesus both before the resurrection and after, with my own eyes and looked upon him, and I have touched, we have touched him with our own hands, this one concerning the word of life. John wastes no time, friends. And his first words about Christian faith that are going to teach us in the classroom are words about the nature of who Jesus is. By the way, I hope that during the Pentecost season, we're going to move into the Holy Spirit 101. We're going to learn about the Holy Spirit and and how that is taught in, in Scripture. So can I just reflect for a minute on why does this matter? You might be thinking, well, that matters a long time ago, but why does it matter today? And to explain that, I want to tell you about an experience I had while in seminary. And let me explain a little bit about how you become a Presbyterian minister or ordained pastor. So, in the ordination process, you are required to get a seminary degree called a Master of Divinity degree at an approved seminary, okay? But you also have this kind of another rail that you move along is called your Committee for Preparation on Ministry. So, you move along your academic rail, but it's like a railroad. There's another rail that you have to be traveling along, and that is your committee, and they have a lot of power over you, a lot of power. Whatever they say, you do, because they are the body of the Presbyterian Church that looks over your ordination and will one day say, yes, this candidate is ready to be ordained. They can require whatever they want of you. And one of the things they require is usually now, most every presbytery requires this, something we call clinical pastoral education, CPE as it's known. And at least when I took it, it was divided into a three-part experience. Your CPE unit, and that was about a semester or a summer, let's say, your CPE unit had three parts. It had um, experiential. A lot of times you're on the floor of a hospital and you serve as a chaplain. You can also do it in a congregational setting, but most common, I would say, in hospitals. So one-third of your time was on the floor meeting patients, okay? Another third of that time was in the classroom, and you would learn things, okay? That was important. And then the last third was processing, You were in a group with a CPE supervisor, and they were very good at having you share your experiences on the floor and what you were learning and put them together with how you were feeling. What am I feeling deep inside myself? So this is a wonderful experience, CPE, for a a new pastor, right? You learn a lot about yourself, and... um, And you learn a lot about ministry. So I want to tell you two stories, and then I'll reflect on why this matters. The first story was when I was asked to do chaplain. There were probably seven of us in my CPE group, so, you know, we each got a couple opportunities to host Sunday chapel in the hospital. And I I served at Southern Baptist Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. And so I got my worship service ready. One of my first sermons that I'd preached um, was to this little chapel at a hospital. It was packed with about 13 people, okay? (laughs) Maybe 23, okay. 23 busting out the doors of this chapel to hear this chaplain uh, speak from seminary. And um, 
So the thing was, it was, you know, you didn't have a lot of resources in that department. So we didn't have a musician, you know, we didn't have a pianist like Mare to, you know, come and play. And so they had this piano that was electronic. And all you had to do was, um, remember the little floppy disks? You'd put it into it and you could program what song you wanted. And you hit a button and it played your song. And you, you would kind of lead the singing as you went. So I, I, I programmed an Amazing Grace, and um, I said, it's time for us to sing together our opening hymn this morning, Amazing Grace, and I hit it, and I started singing, and all of a sudden, a nurse came shooting straight at me, and she said, sit down at the piano bench, and I said, oh, I'm leading the singing. I, why do you need me to? She said, I am from the psych ward. And I need to tell you, in the back, we have seven schizophrenic patients. We tell them to touch base with reality all week. We're trying to get them in touch with reality. We bring them to chapel, and they see a piano playing with no one playing at it. Sit down in the bench and act like you're playing the piano. So, dutifully, I went and acted like I was playing and singing the rest of Amazing Grace. No kidding. One of my favorite, favorite stories of something I learned. It wasn't two weeks later that the pager, the dreaded pager, we had overnight duty. And I was on duty, and the dreaded pager went off at 2.30 a.m. It was my first death call. For the very first time as a pastor, I had to walk, or a chaplain, I was not ordained as a pastor yet, I walked into the room just as Bob had passed away, I later found out. I never met him. 38-year-old man who died of lung cancer, never smoked a cigarette a day in his life, not that that matters, but it didn't help one way or the other. When I met Mary in her first and awful moments of being a widow, for me, it was the first time that I'd ever been that close to a dead body. To make things worse, Bob and Mary had two children, who were about the age that I was when my father died. So you see why they do CPE, that processing part, right? So that all these connections you're making, you have to make sure you can deal with them internally so that you can care for someone in the hospital, so that I could care for Mary. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Just this young student. So I said, tell me about Bob. And she started sharing some memories that we ended up laughing over and some that she fell back into tears over. Tell me about your kids. They were in there briefly and then were taken out by a family member. And we stumbled through that. And we stumbled through all the details then that you have to do when you're taking care of a loved one who's passed away in the hospital before you can leave. And I didn't know those things. I was learning them as I was trying to help Mary through that process of a funeral home and all of that. And then at the very end, I said, well, let's pray. And we joined hands, and Bob's hand, I remember, distinctly was so cold already. Several hours had passed. So cold. And can I tell you, when I came home from that, I remember I met Barbara. We were in seminary housing, and we hugged. And can I tell you, I, I reflected actually on First John because it was being taught at our seminary. And I reflected about why this theology that John is so insistent on that he runs into the classroom in the front of the chalkboard and says, I declare to you, that this Jesus, I saw him, I heard him, I touched him. Why is he so insistent? I discovered that night in Southern Baptist Seminary why. Because Bob needed a Savior who had a bodily death, whose body had grown cold in a tomb for three days, and three days later was resurrected to ensure that he offered his hands and his feet touch me, he said, as evidence that I'm not a ghost, I'm not a phantom. You see, friends, Bob did not need a phantom in that moment. And Mary, 
Mary needed a Jesus who was real and not a phantom to assure her that her husband was well and made whole and that cancer could no longer touch him. She needed to know a risen Savior whose scars were healed over and that he wasn't a ghost, a Jesus who was bodily raised and ate broiled fish by the Sea of Galilee. See, Mary needed that at that moment. And by the way, the schizophrenics on the fifth floor, all seven of them in that chapel, hearing amazing grace, they needed more than a ghost. They needed a resurrected one, a healer who could touch them one day in their resurrection and reconnect all the broken synapses of that horrible disease because he, Jesus, was broken too in body and reconnected in resurrection. And you and I too, whether we know it or not, this is John. This is why John is so fired up when he walks into the front of the classroom and why he says, this was no phantom. Let me tell you, this was no phantom. I was there. I heard him. I saw him. I touched him. And it matters. Have you ever had that frustrating experience (laughs) of knowing something is true and yet everyone's telling you it's not, but you know it is because you were there. Friends, that's John. And those are his first words as he walks into the classroom. Doesn't even say welcome. And we're going to begin this journey through First John. We're going to learn about what it means to follow Jesus in the world. And John is going to take us through the museum. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you on this post-Easter Sunday when we celebrate you as a risen Savior. Thank you for um, John's insistence on what he saw and heard and experienced and how it can matter in a hospital room and how it can matter to all of us sitting here. And help us to deal with that deep, deep mystery of the resurrection and what it can mean. We ask all these things in the powerful name of our God who created us and Jesus who was resurrected and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. A real Jesus, we proclaim. And all God's people say, amen. Well, as our musicians come forward, we are going to um, turn our hearts and turn our eyes and turn our thoughts upon Jesus in a a great old song made new. Would you rise to your feet and let's sing together. If you'd bow your heads, let's receive a, a charge and a blessing. I send you, I charge you to go as children of the living God, beloved, touched, embraced. And as you go into your week, know that you most importantly are loved and claimed. And as you go, hear these words given to us as last words. I will go with you always, he said even to the end of all things. And all God's people together said, 
Amen.